uh, postdoc in Chicago in the lag of Michael Kramer. Um, and before that, got his master's in economics at the Paris School of Economics. And before that, got his BA here, Michigan, in economics and international studies. And Kevin works in different places around the world. He will be telling you about some field studies um, and policy questions in Kenya today, but also works in India. So please welcome Kevin to our series. Is this? Yeah. Um, so thanks, Catherine, and thanks for having me. I'm very excited to talk to a room full of mostly psychologists. I'm a behavioral economist, and these kinds of interdisciplinary opportunities are sadly uh, not super common. So I'm very uh, excited to share with you this research and hear, hear all of your thoughts on this. So today I'm going to be talking about a project that's broadly about the psychology of borrowing where we ran a series and are running a series of field experiments um, among Kenyan dairy farmers. So I'll set the stage by just kind of uh, broadly talking about some motivation on why we're studying uh, psychology and economics in the context of development economics. And so I'll start by just giving you some historical perspective on this topic. Um, traditionally, about 100 years ago, people argued that the process of development, so the process of an economy growing, um, was really about the, how people thought before and after modernity. So if you go back and read Marx, you'll find this distinction between pre-capitalist and capitalist societies. If you read Weber, you'll read about traditionalism versus rationalism. Durkheim, you'll read about mechanical versus organic solidarity. And so development itself is really thought of as a fundamental change in human psychology. How did people think in traditional societies and how did people think in, in modern societies and using that as sort of the dichotomy that was drawn in this literature. And so to, um, if, if you weren't expecting to, uh, an economist to quote the Communist Manifesto, I'm gonna break that expectation now. Mm -hmm. um, Marx argued that capitalist society is distinguished from pre-capitalist societies by the icy water of egotistical calculation. So it was really thought of as this kind of psychological process of development and how people thought as they related to the economy. This set the groundwork for what was called modernization theory that happened in the 1950s. So again, we had this distinction between what were thought of as traditional versus modern societies. Um, this distinction now being drawn by things like education and that being a criteria for jobs, um, secular, secularization of society, um, more nuclear kinship norms, um, and all of these things were thought of as really being what distinguishes the development process and brings a society from being traditional into being modern. Then in the 1960s, 70s, 70s and 80s, uh, neoclassical economics arose and really rejected the notion of um, psychological modernity in favor of this term called homo economicus, so the rational economic person. Um, and so now I'm gonna quote a different economist, um, Schultz, a Nobel Prize winner, of the Chicago School of Economics who really viewed de developing countries as um, being poor but efficient. So there was this idea, the idea that there were potentially these poverty traps, that people were behaving in purely rational and efficient ways, and just that the kind of macroeconomic theories and models um, prevented some poor countries from growing in the way that um, richer countries did. So now I'll move into just presenting some um, kind of bread and butter economics here. Um, so the reason to do this is because really when we actually look at these neoclassical models, we see a kind of disconnect between what we're seeing in the theory and empirical evidence that kind of sets the groundwork for trying to better understand the psychology of how people engage in economics and engage in their societies and how the growth process works. So I'll just, um, this is just one side of these. If, if you're bored of this, um, we'll, we'll, we'll be done pretty soon. Um, so on the left-hand side um, is a utility function that people are trying to maximize. So your utility is their general welfare. Um, C is consumption. And then the delta term is just how much they discount that over time. Um, they're maximizing the utility, choosing how much they're gonna consume in each period subject to a budget constraint. So this um, part on the right-hand side simply states that um, the amount you save in a current period is then um, max is, is multiplied by the rate of return of what you're saving, your capital, and then that determines how much you have in the next period. 
So this is kind of the standard budget constraint that we all face in our own lives. So what you save today determines how much you have tomorrow to save and consume. And you're trying to uh, decide how much you're gonna actually save today. And so the, one of the standard equations that we get if you take um, an economics class at the intermediate level is this Euler equation, which really characterizes how much your growth, um, what, your, what your pattern of growth is over time of consumption itself. And so what we see is the amount that you're, the change in consumption that you have in the current period then determines the change in consumption you have in the next period, your marginal utility of consumption, um, multiplied by the rate of return of capital and a discount rate. So what does this actually mean? It essentially means that, you know, if you have a larger return on capital, if uh, capital is more productive, technology is more productive, that means you'll want to save more today, invest it in capital, consume less today, so that then you, your consumption pattern can grow in the future. So now why am I saying all of this? I'm saying all of this to really then draw a distinction between what we actually see in practice versus what's predicted by this model. So typical rates of return on capital are, are quite high. So standard evidence, when you um, give people an uh, amount of money, ask them to invest it, you see rates of return that are often 150% or, or larger. Um, typically, we think of discount rates, the amount that you discount the future relative to the present as close to one, slightly less than one. And so if we're to take this model seriously, what does this mean? Well, it means that we see huge um, increases in people's consumption over time. So relative to what the model predicts, we actually see much less. So the model would predict that people relative to what we see in the field, people would be uh, spending less today, saving a lot, experiencing a huge return in capital, and then be growing in terms of the amount they're actually able to consume. And the, this would be basically the development ha process happening extremely rapidly. Um, this would imply a 44% rate in consumption growth, which is nothing like what we see in the real world. And so this brings up kind of the key question that this talk is designed to help start to address, which is what are the main factors that limit poor households investment in seemingly profitable technologies? So we've seen a wide range of evidence that investing in capital in low income countries can be really profitable. And yet we see a fairly low take up rate of things like um, fertilizer, things like investment in machinery, um, things like investments in assets for farmers, which will be the topic of the discussion today. And so the question is really, well, how can we better adapt our economic models to incorporate the way people really interact in the, in the world and the kind of psychological processes that determine their economic behavior? Okay, so that's the end of the pain and suffering of the Euler equation. Um, the candidate answer, one of the main candidate answers that I'm gonna to address today in this topic um, is the endowment effect. So this is something that um, probably a lot of us are familiar with. Um, it's a classical finding in psychology and economics that I'll attribute to um, Nesh, Kahneman, and Thaler. Um, Kahneman being someone that economists sort of claim as their own, despite the fact that he's trained as a psychologist. Um, and the main finding here is that people's willingness to accept for an asset is typically greater than their willingness to pay for it. So in a lab, what, we, what we've seen is the example is if I give you, say, a mug, um, you're much less willing to part with that asset than you would be willing to part with money to, to buy a new mug um, because you've developed some sort of kind of attachment to that specific thing by virtue of owning it. Um, so we see this as being unwilling to exchange something that you're endowed with for a new good that would otherwise be of similar value. Um, typically, in, in models, this is thought of as uh, being quite related to loss aversion. So you can think of the endowment effect arising because people are loss averse subject to a reference point. So by reference point, I mean you have a set of goods that you're endowed with, and you're much, much more afraid of kind of losing the things that you're endowed with than you are willing to gain uh, new assets. Okay, so I'll, before getting into what, what I've done in my own research, I'll talk about some of the um, evidence that exists, talk about sort of the global evidence and how we should think about this in the context of understanding um, psychology and economics in, in a more global context. Um, so there's a ton of lab evidence on this. Most of this comes from undergraduates in the US doing things like being given mugs and pens and being asked to exchange them. There's some field evidence that in the early 2000s um, started arising also in the US, um, primarily a series of papers by John List at UChicago, um, where he studied baseball trading card conventions. So he would go to these big conventions that people that were buying and selling baseball cards had, 
And he basically showed that people experienced an endowment effect over baseball cards. Um, so they were less willing to part with baseball cards than they, that they already owned than they were to buy new baseball cards of similar value. Um, there's also this sort of distinction between the endowment effect being studied in high income countries and low income countries. Um, so most of the evidence today comes from a high income country setting. There's a few key studies coming from low income countries that I'll discuss in a moment um, where we see an endowment effect arising um, in, in all of these papers, I guess, except for one. These two are sub Saharan Africa, the middle one is in India. Um, looking at basically people's willingness to exchange um, one good for another and seeing a dominant effect in these settings as well, for the most part, um, with the caveat that I'll discuss. So the purpose of this talk is sort of twofold. The one is um, to try to understand whether the endowment effect um, can help explain this Euler equation puzzle. So to help rationalize why people aren't taking up these seemingly profitable technologies as much as traditional models would expect. Um, and then also to try to understand how to increase financial access in low and middle income countries. So can we use these findings to better design um, financial technologies to increase investments um, and spur economic growth? And then I guess for the purposes of this talk, I'll also say that a final kind of purpose of this paper is to better understand in a global setting, how does the endowment effect arise? Where are we likely to see it? And then what does that imply for policy questions outside of just um, high income country settings? So I'll talk just a little bit more about what we've seen on um, a kind of more diverse stage when we look at research on the endowment effect. So the early research, as I said, came from US undergraduates um, with trading mugs and pens and then other things where they've looked at trading um, these tokens, um, trading all sorts of things that you can basically give undergraduates in a lab setting and trying to see what kinds of utility, um, what kinds of decision frameworks people experience an endowment effect over. And then people started wondering, well, is the endowment effect actually a universal phenomenon? So does it exist simply in the lab or does it exist in the real world? And does it exist around the world? So um, John List um, had these endowment effect experiments where he showed among baseball trading card, um, people at baseball trading card conventions, there was typically an endowment effect, but actually when you looked at more experienced people that were coming, having regularly traded baseball cards, the endowment effect was much smaller. So that sort of seems to suggest that with experience, um, with potentially not being as attached to items because you're already planning on um, trading them, um, the endowment effect is smaller. Um, a similar piece of evidence comes from um, Apicella in 2014, um, where they ran endowment effects experiments in Northern Tanzania among the Hadza um, hunter-gatherers um, this is a, a population where there were some parts um, with plausibly exogenous variation um, of people that had exposure to um, the rest of Tanzania and the economy, other parts where the, the Hadza people did not have exposure to um, the, the rest of the economy, and they found only the endowment effect existed in people with more of this variation and their exposure to the kind of general global economy, and the people that were more isolated didn't um, didn't have this endowment effect in experimental games. Um, and another nice piece of evidence comes from Fair, Fink, and Jack. This is a paper that pretty recently came out um, that also finds some variation in the extent to which people have an endowment effect. This was happening in Zambia. Um, and they found that the endowment effect actually decreases among Zambian farmers that have stronger financial constraints. So in agricultural societies, there's often a hungry season where after you've harvested your crop, after you've sold it, there's a period where you're trying to sow more crops. Um, you, don't have as much disposable income. Um, in this setting, the Zambian farmers, farmers who were um, making these decisions uh, experienced less of an endowment effect in their uh, revealed behavior um, during this hungry season. So, oh, excuse me. Yeah. So those farmers made judgment about keeping or buying or something. What kind of thing? Mugs or chocolate <laughs> or? Yeah. Um, I'm curious. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. I forget the actual context of these ones, but I think it was um, things that people were regularly selling at the market. Um, so that I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, I think that's kind of a key question here is, you know, is this something that we really just see over these specific assets that are given by an experimenter 
or something that we see more broadly. Um, and that's something that the experiment that I'm about to present will try to address to some degree as well, where we're actually using um, assets that farmers are regularly uh, using in their production function. Yeah, and I think what you're pointing to is that there's basically a huge dearth of evidence on how the endowment effects might influence these real world economic behaviors beyond um, what people are calling these weird samples. Um, so we don't have much evidence beyond the mugs and pens experiments. Um, you know, there's some, but I think we really lack a kind of broader understanding of when um, this highly studied effect is likely to exist in, in the real world, and especially outside of just the West. Okay, so in this project, we'll be focusing on the endowment effect and how it relates to um, financial contracts, specifically borrowing contracts where you're taking out a loan and you're required to use a form of collateral as security for the loan. Now, why are we focused on this? So there's a few key reasons. The first is simply that collateral requirements are essentially a huge issue in low and middle income countries. So often, um, Lenders who are hoping to lend to the poor will have to be faced with considering the risk that they face in making a loan. Um, often the, the way that they deal with this is to ask for an asset as security. And the key policy issue here is this, if you're very poor, if you're living hand to mouth, you often don't have assets to provide as security. Um, another key issue is that the kinds of assets that you're borrowing for, um, if they're smaller, if they're more movable, they might not serve as appropriate collateral or be as secure as the lender would like. And therefore, in some cases, lenders just um, basically cease to offer these kinds of contracts because they find them to be too risky. Um, so so I'll in the, for the purpose of this presentation, I'll refer to what I'll call same asset collateralized loans and other asset collateralized loans. Um, so same asset collateralized loans refers to the many loans um, similar to what you would find here in the US if you buy a home or a car where the loan itself is actually financed using the thing that you're purchased at, purchasing as collateral. Um, so if you take out a loan for a home, if you default on the loan, the bank basically owns the home, they can come back and repossess it and then sell it and, and make back the money that they thought they might've lost out on otherwise. In other contexts, there are these other asset collateralized loans where you're basically providing existing assets as collateral. And so in the Kenyan context, these loans are pretty common. Um, you can use land, jewelry, anything else that's valuable as collateral to purchase then as a separate asset. Um, these also exist in the US, so SBA, home equity loans or pawn shops can have kind of similar structures where you're using an asset that you already own, it's already in your endowment and you're being asked to risk that as the collateral for buying a new different asset. So there's some existing work that shows that these collateral requirements can essentially have huge impacts on take up. And so when you go from a context um, like the other asset collateralized loan to, to a, a context where there are same asset collateralized loans, uh, people find the former much more attractive and you find much greater take up rates of loans. So um, people just seem to find these borrowers seem to, in the Kenyan context seem to find these loans much more attractive than sort of the status quo loans that are being offered. Um, by financial institutions. But when we go to think about why this might be, there are a number of ways in which these um, two kinds of loans differ from each other that make it kind of difficult to understand why people actually have this preference. And so you can think that it could just be that the kind of ownership of appropriate assets would be different. Um, here, you're not required to own anything to put up as collateral. Here, you need to have something that you can use as collateral to take out the loan. Um, there could be information asymmetries. So here, if you're using something you already own as collateral, you might know more or less about its value than the uh, lender does. And that might kind of make it difficult for the lender to assess the value of the collateral. Um, there could be different kinds of collateral that are more or less difficult to repossess. Um, there could be different rates of depreciation of the asset. All of these kinds of things make it um, a little bit difficult to understand why people might have these preference preferences um, for, for the same asset collateralized loan over the other asset collateralized loan. And in our paper, we point out one um, specific potential psychological difference between these two kinds of loans, which is that you might anticipate a stronger endowment effect in the other asset collateralized loan. And so by that, I mean that if you're asked to put up an asset that you already own as collateral, you might experience an endowment effect over that asset and therefore be less willing to put it up and risk losing it as collateral for a loan. 
So that's exactly this point here. Why might you feel um, a stronger endowment effect in the other asset collateralized loan? Other asset collateralized loan, you might already lose something that you already own, or sorry, you might lose some, yeah, you might lose something you already own. Same asset collateralized loan, you lose something that you never had to begin with, and so it might not yet be in your reference point. Yeah. How are you distinguishing here between you know, what you're kind of being psychological elements of the attachment uh -huh. versus something that your Michael Carter might say, the risk ratcheting, or yes, it's essentially non linearity from that production function, yeah. and property dynamics, such that there's actually the, it's not asymmetric whether you, you know, gain or lose the same value. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to, um, in a few slides, present, and then there'll be kind of the rest of the talk, presenting this one specific experiment where we, where we try to basically disentangle all of this um, and try to basically take the standard framework of these endowment effect uh, experiments and then try to apply it to these real world decisions. So the idea here is to hold all of these things constant. So the risk profiles, um, probability of default, all of these things. And then just compare um, loans that look exactly the same, but for the collateral that they're um, requiring you to put up. Um, that it may even raise some alarm bells because collateral had different values and that sort of thing. And we'll deal with that as well. And so I'll just, um, yeah, let me know if it's not clear when I get there, but uh, that's, that's basically, that's the question that we came to this project with. It's like, how can we get around all these factors that you mentioned to try to isolate the endowment effect in these, uh, in these decisions? Now I also, so in, in talking about this kind of general intuition of, you know, uh, losing something that you never had to begin with versus losing something you already own. Um, when you think about the comparisons here between these two types of loans, one thing that becomes especially important is when the asset that's being financed actually enters in your reference point or put differently, at what point do you start to develop an endowment effect over the thing that you're purchasing? And so this is what we're referring to as uh, naivete versus sophistication. So a naivete is that um, you, the financed asset may enter re your reference point fully, but you, as a borrower, you don't uh, anticipate this or act upon it. Sophistication means that you correctly anticipate how the financed asset will enter your reference point, and it either fully enters upon purchase or it doesn't fully enter until uh, the loan is paid off. Now, why am I making this distinction? If you the reason is that if you take a step back and you think about the perspective that borrowers might have over these kinds of loans at the point when they're taking them up versus after the contract has already started, um, the, the key issue here is that in both loans, once you've uh, started the loan, you receive the asset, at that point, you really have both of the assets that are being required, either collateral or being bought as in your possession. And so even if you're, required, if you're um, using the thing that you're purchasing as collateral, the idea here is that you will probably develop an endowment effect over this item, and that'll influence how willing you are to lose it. And so if you anticipate this at the point when you're making the, um, the investment decision, there's no real reason to prefer the um, same asset collateralized loan to the other asset collateralized loan, because you might think, well, what do I have to lose by um, taking up this loan? Well, what I have to lose is that I'll become attached to this thing. And once I become attached to this thing, then it's just as hard, hard to lose it as it is the thing that, I'm, um, that I already own. And so it really requires someone to either be naive about the fact that they'll eventually become attached um, to the thing that they're purchasing, or it requires someone to not um, actually fully become attached to that thing before the end of the contract. In order for us to see a preference for the same assets, collateralized loan over the other assets, Loan. So it's the fact that people either don't fully become attached to the thing that they're buying or that they don't anticipate that attachment um, that needs to exist for them to have this preference that we've, we've seen in some of the existing research. And so a second part of this project that I'll discuss is kind of trying to understand, well, what are people's anticipations when they go into these kind of contract and when they're presented with these two options? Yeah. Can I just ask a question about, so you presented some research with the baseball card suggesting yeah. that expertise would also diminish the endowment effect. Mm -hmm. Does that fit into this sophistication bucket here that the more expertise and more practice you would have yeah. buying or selling houses, for example, might decrease your attachment to them? Does that... Yeah, Am I, I trying to integrate too much? Yeah, I think, no, I think that's exactly right. And I think you could possibly fit it in here or just here. So it could be, 
So it could be that people are sort of not, uh, less naive when they're baseball card traders because they know, okay, in the past I've become attached to these cards. That's going to hurt me like just as much as the cards that I already own, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, or it could be the case that just if you're a baseball card trader, you just basically develop less of an attachment to begin with. So it might be that, you know, you come to the trading show with this set of cards in your portfolio. You see this as not something that's really yours, but something that is um, in your possession in order to specifically to be traded. And so you yeah. could think that it's just that because they're trading so frequently, they just don't become as attached to these assets um, as people that, you know, have a, uh, some special car in their possession that they really come to like and have seen as their own and then, then are asked to trade. And so, so then the scarcity piece like with the Zambia, yeah. so those sort of environmental inputs into your these are both kind of individual at the individual level, right? Yeah. So where would these sort of context or um, environmental issues kind of show up? Yeah, so... Um, in, in terms of like when, when the finance asset would enter your reference point, as yeah. opposed to scarcity. Right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Think about that. That's a, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know off the top of my head how I would fit that in. I mean, it could just be that there's still an endowment effect and it's outweighed by other forces when you have really serious um, uh, like you don't budget have constraints. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. yeah, it could be something like that. I think this is somewhere that's really kind of the next frontier in terms of trying to do this research is understanding why do these things exist in certain contexts and why do they not. And, you know, we have some, like, basically, with each, with each of these papers, we have a different data point from a different setting, but it, we don't have, we're not at the point yet where we're able to then control for those things and understand what those different settings mean for when we see the endowment effect and what we don't. Yeah. Yeah. Great, so this paper that I've been alluding to is called The Endowment Effect and Collateralized Loans. It's a working paper with Michael Kramer, Shin Yu Lin, and Gautam Rao. And we ran an experiment to um, understand these two questions that I laid out. So the first is, does the endowment effect have a causal effect that makes borrowers prefer collateralizing loans with new rather than old assets? So basically prefer these same asset collateralized loans to other asset collateralized loans. We're aiming to do this while eliminating all the other reasons beyond an endowment effect that someone might prefer a same asset to another asset collateralized loans loan. And then the second question that follows from this is, is, is this preference because people underestimate how attached they'll come to feel to the new asset that they're purchasing. So the setting of this project is a field experiment with dairy farmers in central Kenya. Um, this is a setting in which the uh, average daily income is about $2 a person and there's substantial volatility, um, some due to uh, seasonality, some due to weather shocks, some due to climate change. Um, and these are loans that are being offered by a savings cooperative. So this is a pretty common financial institution in East Africa and across Africa. Um, it's a savings and credit cooperative, a SACO. You can think of it as pretty similar to a credit union where borrowers themselves have a stake in the um, SACO. Um, it provides pretty simple financial services. So deposit accounts and loans. Um, all participants in this study are members. So we recruited from one SACO, our partner organization's um, client base. And so because of that, there's sort of this repeated interaction between the participant and the lender. That's just kind of a contextual detail to keep in mind for this study. We had a great team up that was helping us with data collection. So some of you here have worked at the Busara Center in Nairobi. Um, we also had an organization called Innovations for Poverty Action helping us. Um, I wanna give a special shout out to Salome and Jambi and Mary Wawira and Frank Odiambo who were the ones really in the field throughout the experiment running the study. Um, and this is just a picture of me with the field team. Um, we're handling here a series of objects that will become clear in a moment um, why we're holding. Um, but these were the things that we were offering people as part of this experiment. Okay, so just a basic um, sample table about these 700 people we, we re recruited. So the mean age is 51. This is a fairly old sample um, in this setting. It's pretty common for people when they're young to migrate into Nairobi and to stay there. Um, so a lot of these people were older people who have worked on their farms their entire lives. Um, we have gender balance in the sample, um, which is sort of a feature of the, the population of farmers in this context. The um, lender is just as likely to lend to women as men, and they're just as likely to be individual members um, rather than acting as a household. 
Um, yeah, I don't, I don't want to go through this in its entirety, but you can see some of the summary stats here. So um, yeah, a lot of people already had outstanding loans. Um, most of them are getting most of their income from dairy. Um, some of them are getting their income from, from farming land. And these are pretty small older farmers. So on average, they have just about two cows um, per participant that they're using to generate most of their income. Okay, so an outline of the experiment. So the main thing that we're get, trying to get at here is um, demand for same asset and other asset collateralized loans. Um, I'll talk about the experimental design, um, then go through just the standard results. Then I'll talk about the predictions, um, discuss a kind of model of economic behavior and how our results fit in, and then just discuss a little bit about what this means for borrower welfare. So just st starting with the kind of basic comparison. So what we wanted to compare was demand for same asset collateralized loans and other asset collateralized loans while isolating the endowment effect. So just a simple sort of uh, mental exercise. Suppose we simply randomize people to either receive a same asset or an other asset collateralized loan to purchase a new asset. There are a few problems that come to mind here. So the first could be that if you're offered a other asset collateralized loan, you might just not have any assets to provide as collateral. The other thing is that we don't know how much people value the assets that they're being asked to provide as collateral. So it could be that you really value the thing that you're able to um, use in the other asset collateralized loan. It could be that you really value the new item and you know that the thing you already have is actually complete crap. Um, and as experimenters, we have no idea about what people prefer. And for that reason, they might just prefer one loan to the other because they value the items differently. So if that happened, we couldn't attribute any difference to the endowment effect. What do we do instead? So we have a pretty simplified procedure where we identified uh, two assets that were common to the context. These are, um, as you saw on the previous slide, things like uh, uh, milk cans, uh, cooking pots, things to spray your cow. So we identified two of these items. Then we randomly selected one from a set of four items in total and gave it to the participant. So this is the, what I'll call the endowed item. Then later we came back a week later after they'd owned that endowed item for a week. And we offered them loans for a second item and varied whether they were offered a same asset collateralized loan or another asset collateralized loan. And so in the same asset collateralized loan, what are you using as collateral? You're using the thing that we're now offering you to purchase. And the other asset collateralized loan, what are you using as collateral? It's the thing that we gave you a week ago. So because of the randomization, we know that the collateral in both of the loans should averaging across participants have the same valuation. We also know that the new item that's being offered for sale should across participant have the same valuation because we're randomizing which both of these things are from a pool of common assets. So we tried to basically offer assets as uh, endowed items and for purchase that were common to the context. So these were things like uh, cans to hold milk, a thing to spray your cow with insecticide, um, a cooking pot, and a large thermos to hold things like tea and coffee warm. Each of these have a value on the market of about $30. Um, and they're familiar brands that are available locally. So these are things that people are pretty um, familiar with and, and are common in, in their uh, set of assets. We wanted to kind of limit the scope for learning over the week's time about the usefulness or the quality of the things that we were giving people. So here's a picture of the actual items themselves. Um, this is the cow sprayer. Um, you can also use it to spray plants. Some of you might have these. Um, this is a cooking pot in plastic. Uh, this is a milk can that's used to collect milk um, from your cow and then sell it back to a dairy cooperative. And this is the thermos that's just used to uh, keep things warm. Okay, so here's the process that people went through. So I mentioned there's these two sessions, one week apart. So in the first session, we elicited several things. The first thing was we wanted to understand how much do people value each of the four items that are potentially at play in the experiment. We did this using a Becker to group Marshock procedure, wherein we asked people basically uh, about a series of prices saying, would you buy this for hundred shillings? Would you buy this for 200 shillings? After they answered all of these questions, then we randomly drew one price um, and then actually I implemented that as the offer price. And so if you said yes to that um, question, you would purchase the thing for that price. If you said no, then you wouldn't purchase it. And so what this gives us is 
We know people's precise switching point for, uh, at which they say go from saying yes to saying no, and that gives us a measure of their valuation for an asset. Um, we elicit people's predictions about their future decisions in the second session a week later. And then at the end of that first session, we randomly selected one of the items and then gave it to the participant, told them this is yours to own, do with it what you wish. Um, and they walked away with this and we told them we'll see you again in a week's time. After a week, they came back and did a second session in which we offered the two loans. So again, we did a similar procedure with the multiple price list that allows us to say precisely what is the maximum amount you'd be willing to pay for a given loan, um, either for a new item financed by the thing we gave you a week ago or the thing that you're buying itself. Um, and then we randomly selected one of the loans and one of the prices to be um, kind of, the, again, the offer price that was, that was given to the person. Um, they received that, they paid off the loan over a course of two months. So these are pretty small loans. Um, they're pretty small assets, but it's not super uncommon in this context to take out contracts like this. Okay, so I mentioned this um, Becker to Group Marshoff procedure. I wanna just explain a little bit more in detail about what this looks like for those who aren't familiar. Um, so as I said, we go through a list of prices, 200 shillings, 400 shillings, all the way up to 3,600 shillings. Um, that's uh, these days about $36. Um, for each of the prices you're asked about, you must say yes or no. So um, you basically say yes up to a certain point, then when it comes to expensive, you say no. Um, after we have the full list of prices, we randomly draw one and we tell them this is the price that's being offered. It was randomized and you're bound to the decisions that you made previously. So economists like this because it's what's termed incentive compatible. So basically um, you have, you can't gamify the system if you understand it and if it's being implemented as described. Um, your, the price that's being offered is independent of the answers that you give to each of the different questions. And then it's in your best interest to basically say yes up to the maximum price that you would pay for an asset. And so that gives us a willingness to pay for the different assets and then also for the different loans. Um, for each individual. Now, some of the, in some cases, because we didn't actually want to, um, to uh, implement people's decisions with a high probability, we would lose sample in some cases, and I'll describe this in a moment. Um, but I should say that one caveat is that in some cases, we um, didn't actually implement uh, the decisions with a high probability that still keeps the incentives there, um, but there's only some chance that you'll actually be offered any contract at the end in some cases. Okay, so I'll get into some results. So the first thing that we show is just that when you look across the different items that were at play for each of these contracts, we see, as you would expect, that the average willingness to pay for each of the assets is the same, regardless of whether it's being used as the thing that you're being given to begin with, um, whether it's the new thing you're buying, or whether it's the new thing that you're um, using as collateral at the baseline. And so this is before people have been given anything, they're willing to pay the same um, on average for the assets that are being used as the endowed item, the new item being purchased using a same asset collateralized loan and the new item purchased using another asset collateralized loan. So this is basically just saying, look, the randomization worked. Um, we wanted to randomly draw items just so that they would have the same average x any valuation. And indeed, that's what we see in the data when we look at their valuations using the BDM procedure. Maybe this is a very naive question. Yeah. Is there any motivation for those people, people to buy this second stuff uh, by borrowing money? You mean rather than just buying it out, right? Or not buying it at all. Well, not buying it. Yeah. Yeah. Do they want it? Or yeah, so. Do they need it? Yeah, so in, um, I guess that's mo the best evidence of this is that there were positive valuations here. Um, on average. So people are perfectly free to say, no, I don't want to buy it at any price. So you can say, would you buy it for zero shillings? Sure, I would take it for free. Would you buy it for 200 shillings? No, I'm out. Like, and that's something that we see in, in practice is that some people, you know, they have lots of cooking pots. Um, they're not super willing to buy another one. And we allow them to do that here. Um, so yeah, I think your the intuition is exactly right that you know for all people these might not even be things that they really want, 
Um, but because we have enough people that are willing to buy them at some price, we can then see how do preferences change for those people. Yeah. Okay, so this is the main sort of reduced form result. Um, using the same willingness to pay, but now rather than looking at the items at the baseline, looking at willingness to pay for items using a same asset versus another asset collateralized loan. And so when we look at how much you're willing to pay for an item, again, randomly assigned, um, when you're using that item as collateral itself, people are willing to pay much more than if they're asked to use the thing that we gave them a week ago as collateral. And this is a quite significant difference uh, statistically. So that's the basically main takeaway result. If you want just kind of one result from the paper, this would be it. Um, we run the same result using a regression, which allows us to get some more precision and include controls. So here, um, it's a little bit atypical because what we're using as outcomes are actually differences. So subtracting um, willingness to pay for one loan from the other, and then doing the same for um, the, the baseline valuations. Um, essentially, the main takeaway here is that this difference that we see here in regression form is represented by this uh, beta zero coefficient. So the constant represents um, the difference in willingness to pay um, for the two loans, now controlling for how much you value the various items at the baseline before we gave you anything. So again, we see basically the same results. So um, this shouldn't be a surprise. It's basically showing that randomization worked. When you include controls, you see the same thing as when you just compare means. Um, we see a statistically significant increase in willingness to pay when you're able to use the thing that you're buying as collateral relative to when we're asking you to use the thing we gave you a week ago as collateral. Um, we've converted this into the equivalent monthly interest rate, and this is approximately the same as about an 8%, I guess 8.8% .8 difference um, in monthly interest rate. So you're willing to pay 8.8% 8 .8 more in interest in order to be able to use the thing that you're buying as collateral. So this is pretty economically meaningful. I mean, 8% in interest is quite a big difference when you're taking out a loan. Um, and nonetheless, that's what we see in terms of people's preferences between these two loan types. The percentage points though. Uh, it's percent, yeah. But it's like interest rate. I mean, it's interest rate percent, so it's kind of- Interest rate percent. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So can you provide um, a 8.8%, that is basically the, that's the same asset collateralized loan as the other asset. They they cost the same, but people were just willing to mark the like the lenders not respond to that greater willingness to pay and upcharge the same asset collateralized loan. Yeah, so in, in this context, these uh, these loans weren't being offered prior to the research team coming in. So one of the previous studies that I mentioned was just showing that demand is higher, and that was basically when we not me, but some of my co-authors about 10 years ago started partnering with the SACO and uh, studying this. And then it, they found it was really attractive. The SACO thought this is amazing and they've offered it now to everyone. Um, but I don't think they do any sort of price discrimination. Um, I guess their main uh, difference, the, the, the main other kind of collateral they use is actually to use the, uh, other people's uh, deposits in their accounts. So like you have family members guaranteeing your loan, that sort of thing. Um, don't they don't have any price differential on those? But they um, don't explain that on that. No, they don't. Yeah, they don't seem to. Uh, I mean, they, they also follow our research findings typically, so maybe they will start to. But uh, we haven't made that this particular point clear to them. Uh, yeah, but as you were saying, like it's really striking because at least we find it quite striking because by virtue of the fact that we're just randomly determining which of the items are being purchased using these things, and that changes from person to person. You should really think that they would be willing to pay the exact same thing. Like the thing you're buying is the same across everyone on average. Um, so it's really the collateral that makes a difference. Um, when I get into default rates, I'll also describe why that's a bit more striking. Um, the fact is that people are very unlikely to default. And so collateral only really matters if you default. And so it's all the more like, why does it matter if default rates are low? Um, but that's what we see on the less. Okay. Yeah. Quickly, did the for the other uh, asset one, do they have to actually present their collateral? Like, like how do you know they still have it? And how does that kind of affect this demand? I'm, I'm a little concerned. Yeah, yeah. So we don't ask them to actually bring it back in. Um, we do ask them, do you still have it? What have you done with it? I think one person in the sample said, sorry, I already sold it. <laughs> <laughs> 
And in that case, you know, there's not much that you can do. Um, I guess the other thing that I would say is in practice, they can, after the second round, they can go home and do the exact same thing for the same asset collateralized loan. They could also just go and sell the thing. And so by the time the second session happens, basically these contracts are the same where, um, you know, it's not great collateral because it can be moved, it can be sold, it can be hidden. Um, but the main concern in terms of making the comparison is just making sure that people didn't sell it over the first week. I mean, uh, yeah. I would be a little concerned that people are lying about that. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, this yeah. is exactly what respondents typically are not are reluctant to tell people that give them stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. And especially in your case, though, yeah. uh, because these are probably duplicate items. Maybe they're, they're just letting friends use it, you know, yeah. and they may, they may say, like, no, I, I don't want to risk, I know I'm not supposed to take this loan. Yeah. If I sold it, I'm going to just kind of not really bid on this item. Yeah. For the other, and it's not really the down issue. It's a, I don't yeah. know. Thank you. Yeah, that's a fair point. Um, I'm trying to think what. I think we have some other outcomes on this, but I don't have a great answer for that. I think also like one thing that I'll show you is when we see what people predicted and how their predictions compared to their actual behavior, um, it makes it a little bit hard to rationalize a selling story, but um, but that's a little bit more suggestive. So they were aware they were going to come back and ask them about it. No, we didn't tell them for the specific one that they had to do anything with it. But um, they didn't make and yeah, they, they made predictions in some cases. So we, we were concerned about whether the predictions would basically bind people to their decisions. So we uh, only elicited predictions a third of the time. Um, and we don't see any differences in behavior, whether you make the predictions or not. But, um, yeah, the predictions themselves are pretty suggestive that we'll do something that we, because we're asking you to. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. To go back to the slide. Yeah. So here, yeah, and one more. Yeah. So average price is about 1200 Yeah. Now, on the next page, basically people are saying, okay, I'm, I'm borrowing 1200 using the item I got. Yeah. Right? yeah. That's as much as you can get. So this pattern could be merged if the second item, that is item presented to you as a possible purchase, is more expensive. No? Because you can borrow more to get this, but yeah. it's impossible to get the money uh, with the item that you have. Yeah. Yeah, I think I see what you mean. Um, right, I mean, I, I'm getting, this item seems like, you know, $1,400, about yeah. $1,400. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I want to borrow that money by using the, the same thing, right? Yeah. But even if I want to do it, I cannot do it with the item that you gave me because it doesn't seem as expensive. Yeah. So I guess maybe a few things to say and then you can let me know if this answers this. So um, so we have these four items. And so for some, like, so in the first period, we randomly decide which one we're giving you. So for some people, it's the cooking pot, for some people, it's the thermos, um, and so on and so forth. Then you come back a week later and we do the same thing. And so- Why? Well, so one was why? Yeah, exactly. So now the thing that you're buying here is still one of the other four items. So we gave you the thermos. But why, why is it that they are borrowing, oh, I see, same item. Yeah. They are borrowing more money than the item on average. Yeah, so it's, um, but, yeah, so it's pretty similar. So this is what they value for the items um, when they're not using any sort of loan. We just ask them, what, what would you pay for any of these items? So it's about 1200 and what you'll see here is for the other asset collateralized loan is still about 1200. And so I guess I would interpret this kind of markup as the additional value of um, being able to you take out a loan and use the thing that you're buying as collateral. Um, but that's kind of because it suggests that there's like an income effect only for say asset collateral, right? Yeah, or it could just be that you can pay slightly more because in, in the second, so in this first case, you're just buying it outright. In the second case, you're buying it using a two month loan. So perhaps you can. But for the other asset, it's the same amount. That's yeah, exactly. Amount. So there is no income effect. Um, what do you mean by income effect? Like, the, there's no, when you think about the demand, like, okay, well, you, you, you might think of it as like, oh, if, if I had more money, what would my kind of effect like? Yeah. Demand. Be why it bid up to this amount. Yeah. And there's there's no change. Yeah, right. 
uh, right here. Yeah, so the other thing to say is that um, because we didn't want to eliminate one of the assets from this, the set of four that we um, could give someone, we use a really low probability for this price solicitation. So most people didn't actually end up um, buying one of these assets. So they gave us their prices. And then um, in most of cases, they were told, OK, we randomly didn't select. We didn't select you to actually implement that decision. So there are a few people that did actually end up buying this thing, and they're um, poorer in the second round. Um, but mo most people, that didn't happen. Does that answer your question? Yeah, kind of answers. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so we've basically run the same um, comparison now, just looking across the different items and seeing what is the um, what does the treatment effect look like if depending on which item you're actually endowed with to begin with. And so, if it's some sort of story about either learning about the asset or selling the asset or something like that, you might think that. Some assets, there's more scope for learning. You might think that some assets are you're more able to sell in the market. And in that case, you would see a different treatment effect across the different items. It's kind of strikingly similar how the size of the effect is the same, regardless of what is the thing that we gave you in week one or in, in day one as the thing that we then went back and asked you to use as collateral. Okay, so just to get into some, just like for full disclosure, get into some discussion of what are the potential compounds. There is this learning compound. You could take the thing home. You realize it's a complete lemon. This cooking pot doesn't work. And therefore, because you've learned about it, um, you're more likely to be willing to use it as collateral um, or less likely, I guess, in our context. So that's the point here is you would need systematic positive updating. So you'd need to learn for the effect to go in this direction. You'd need to learn this thing was surprisingly good. Um, we also look at, uh, heterogeneity and past experience with an item. Um, so how many cooking pots do you have to begin with? If you own a lot of cooking pots, you're probably better able to tell, is this a good or a bad cooking pot? Um, we don't see any different treatment effects by people with more experience with the thing we gave them. Um, on the last slide, I so you there was no difference across the four items. Um, and also I'll show you people's predictions and that this story is inconsistent with them um, mispredicting the endowment effect. Um, you can also think that there's just kind of this hedging value of taking out um, a same asset collateralized loan. So you could think if the thing breaks, I can just default strategically. Um, the, the durable items, so most people probably didn't really think of this as something that they would do. And it's also, again, inconsistent with the predictions that we had people make. Um, there's also just the general um, concern with an experiment like this about confusion. Um, but we did a bunch of comprehension checks. We had people do quizzes before we did these price solicitations. Um, and people generally pass these quizzes. Um, there's also, again, level of evidence of heterogeneity here. So it's not that it's more or less educated people that are showing the fact. So I have some of this here. So this is just the experience um, heterogeneity. And then we also have heterogeneity by whether, um, based on local gender norms, whether the subject themselves is more or less likely to use the item that they're being endowed with. Um, and the treatment effects are similar um, with no significant heterogeneity um, using both of these measures. OK. So now I'll go into this question of whether people will anticipate or not the endowment effect, whether that can help kind of complete the story that we're seeing here. So just going back to the question that I laid out earlier, we wanna know whether people get more attached to the same asset collateralized loan item that they're purchasing than they anticipated. So if you do get attached to the new item, you'll repay the loan more. Um, and in the behavioral economics literature, this is typically referred to as projection bias. So you're basically under predicting your future endowment effect and we'll, we'll call that projection bias. Now, what do we do in terms of eliciting predictions? So ideally what we'd wanna see is compare your predicted and your true endowment effect over the thing that you're purchasing using a same asset collateralized loan. Um, so you take out a loan, then we, we come back to you later and see how willing are you to um, take out that loan than you would have initially predicted. But the problem here is that we would only observe that for people that actually take out the loans. We have a selected sample problem here because people that are getting these loans are the ones that on average are willing to pay more. 
So instead, what we did is we elicited predictions over what we've called the endowed good, endowed good. So the thing we give you in the first se session, um, before giving it to you, we asked you to make predictions both about um, how much it would take for us to actually buy the thing back from you, and then also what prices you would be willing to accept for both of these two kinds of loans. So the loan take up decision happens in the second session. But for a third of participants, we come to them in the first session. We explain these two kinds of loans. We tell them, suppose we gave you this randomly determined item. Let's say it's a cooking pot. We say, suppose we gave you a cooking pot. How much would it take for us a week later to buy that cooking pot back from you? And then furthermore, imagine we were to offer you a loan for these other items. How much would you be willing to pay if we use that item as collateral versus the cooking pot that we're asking you to imagine we're giving to you. So there's a lot of imagining going on here. We did a lot of explanation, but essentially what we're trying to do is ask people to predict two things. First, their willingness to pay for the item after a week of ownership. And then second, what that translates into in terms of their willingness to pay for these two different loans. Okay, so this is just the outline of how things happen. So now I'm gonna be talking about these predictions. So first session, predictions about future decisions, Second session, then we actually ask people to buy the thing back from them. So we'll see how that compares to their predictions. And then we'll also see how their um, predicted loan willingness to pay compares to their predictions in the first session. Okay. So willingness to accept WTA. Um, we did this in the first session, um, doing a similar price list as, as we do throughout. Um, to basically get a, a switching point, but now it's a predicted switching point. So at what point do you predict that you'll go from not being willing to pay to being willing to pay? Um, I may have misspoken to you, Catherine. I guess in this, this predicted sample, uh, a third of the people are making the predictions and we are telling them that they'll actually make the decision in a week's time. Um, but when a week comes, we're not reminding them, them of what they said. Um, we also just wanted to follow what behavioral economists tend to like, which is actually incentivizing things using um, monetary incentives. So we had some incentive for getting the predictions right. Um, but because we were concerned about people using that sort of as a commitment mechanism and, and committing themselves to um, pay a cost if they didn't do what they said they would previously, we only did that for half the sample. Um, and we don't find any effects of the incentive when we make the comparison between those who had it and those that didn't. Um, so that's part of this anchoring problem here, which is also why we only had a third of people actually making these predictions. Um, so all the results that I'll show you are from this smaller sample where we're taking a third, whatever a third of 700 is, that's the sample size is of um, this kind of sub-experiment. So the first result I'll show you is just predictions of same asset collateralized loans. So um, again, we, Ask people to imagine this hypothetical where we gave them an asset, then we asked them, um, imagine we asked you to buy a different asset using that different asset as collateral. What would you be willing to pay? Um, you may remember the, the um, willingness to pay from a few slides previously, and the prediction is exactly the same. So people really get it spot on when we ask them how much would they be willing to pay for an asset using that asset as collateral. And when we look at the other asset collateralized loan, we see a quite different story. So again, I guess just looking at this bar and comparing it to this bar, this is the main figure that I showed you on the previous slide. The predicted other asset collateralized loan falls basically square in the middle of um, what people actually were willing to pay for that other asset collateralized loan and then what they were willing to pay for the same asset collateralized loan. So they seem to sort of get the fact that in the future, this kind of a loan is gonna be less attractive to them. We tell them that we'll give them the thing, they'll have a week and then they'll be risking that thing as collateral. That doesn't seem super attractive, but they don't get the full extent to which that'll be unattractive. So they still overestimate um, the amount that we want to pay for that kind of loan. So it's sort of a, what we describe as a partial sophistication, partial naivete story. We see the exact same thing when we ask people about their uh, willingness to pay, or sorry, willingness to accept for the thing that we endow with them with. So we give you a cooking pot. Um, the first session we tell, ask them, suppose we came back in a week and asked to buy this back from you, what do you think you would say? And then we actually do that a week later. 
So again, the prediction is, gets people almost the, almost the way there. So they predict that it'll be pretty hard for them to part with this thing, but they don't get exactly how hard it will be to part with this thing. Now here I'm showing you the set the results when we take out the people that are top coded. So what do I mean by that? There's a fairly sizable uh, fraction of the sample that was not willing to part with the asset at any of the prices that we offered. So we went up to about five times the market price for these assets. And we said, now imagine that we come back and uh, buy, buy this thing back from you, what would you take? And then we actually asked that question a week later. Um, and we see a huge difference. Most of this is coming from people saying, uh, I wouldn't part with this thing at all. But even if you exclude those people, we see basically the same result happening where there's a uh, misprediction, but some sophistication. Yeah, Catherine. Does that go, Catherine? Yeah, sure. Does that go to your point? Yes, I, I was just Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I was, uh, no, I love <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think this is very interesting. But yeah. Now, if I were in this situation, yeah. uh, you give me, say, a rice cooker or yeah. something. Yeah. Right. And I can keep it. Yeah. And basically I can use it for free. Yeah. And, you know, use cars and use rice cookers and use whatever become cheaper. Yeah. Once you touch it. Yeah. And now this seems like a bargain yeah. to me. Yeah. And I don't see the psychology of it. Uh, that, that is, you know, I, I got this rice cooker for a week mm -hmm. for free use. Yeah. And this seems like a wonderful thing, and I'm more than happy to give it give it back to you. Yeah, uh, almost. Except clearly, they are demonstrating. Yeah, they're just showing uh, the opposite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think, why is that? I mean, am I? Yeah, we. Am I, <laughs> I, I think we think that it's the known effect. I mean, we think that okay. it's that people just became really attached to it. Um, I think, uh, and I'll get to your question in a second. But I think one thing on the kind of earlier <laughs> possibility that someone would take it, think that it's uh, advantageous to sell it. Like there's no way that they're selling it for this price on the market. <laughs> and there's no way that they would even expect to sell it for this price on the market. So to say something like this would be just really counter to kind of this standard economic reason. So is it possibly because, yeah. you know, this is a wonderful gift. This the Western research area gave yeah. to me. That's very special. Yeah. And the same group is coming back to me and say, can you sell it? If I'm quite enough, I would say, no, absolutely yeah. not. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, so that's what, like, in qualitative work, we try to probe at this a lot. And that's what some people have said they found when they do endowment effect experiments. People say it's a nice gift or it's a beautiful memory or something like that. That's one of the reasons that we wanted to use something that was kind of a standard asset that doesn't look super sentimental. Um, and yeah, I have some like, we, we did a bunch of debriefing with people about why, like, especially in the cases where they said, I would not part the, with this for any amount of money. We said, that seems strange. Like, why are you telling us this? Um, really probing pretty hard. Um, a lot of people said that it was just important to them. It was valuable to them. Um, a handful of people really described the endowment effect, effect. They said, I've become attached to this thing because it's mine. <laughs> um, some people reported a preference for liquid assets. They said they were afraid of squandering the cash themselves. They didn't want to take the cash because they have this valuable thing that they couldn't go spend on temptation goods. That's maybe a slightly different psychology there. Um, but I was like, I was in the field myself asking for these questions when we were setting up the experiment. And I was super surprised to hear uh, like Kenyan dairy farmers describing the endowment effect to me when we were asking them about why they didn't want to give us the thing back. And like pretty forcefully telling them, we would like you to give this thing back to us uh, <laughs> and we'll pay you for it. And so, uh, yeah, I'll start here. Um, so, yeah, I'm fascinated by the, that they already predict, the yeah. they predict that's going to happen. Yeah. So I have two yeah. questions. One is you said they're fairly common items, but is there some difficulty with the people you're studying and obtaining it? Like, or is it pretty easy to walk down to the store and just get one? Yeah, it's quite easy. Okay. Um, and in fact, when we were choosing items, it was me and some of the field officers going around to local stores and asking for prices of things and then finding things. So they could sell it back to you, go buy one. Yeah, they could buy it basically the same thing. Okay, yeah. That's important. And yeah. then that other thing was just, is it an uncommon thing to have? Are there few enough possessions that, I mean, the first one sort of takes care of that because they can just replace it. Yeah. But yeah, that you no, know, it's not commercialized to the extent that you have so much stuff, it doesn't matter. Anymore. Yeah. 
I don't, I don't think so. So I, I'm like, I think about half of the people already owned one of the things that they were buying. So, uh, yeah. Can I just add a question? Yeah, yeah. Can you put the graph right Yeah. So this if I'm can... interpreting the, the it's either one is fine. This one, um, if I'm interpreting, sorry, this one. If yeah. I was, if I'm interpreting this correctly, yeah. if I say I am willing to accept 5,500 yeah. and you say, here's 5,000, yeah. like I, I'm out. Um, it's like you won't buy it from me. So is, um, the question I'm trying to get at is like, how much gaming is going on here? Yeah. Like, are they trying to read you or like read the situation? Like, can I say 4,000 to see like how, how much can push you? Or is yeah. this more similar to the willingness to pay where like they, they write it all in advance and they don't know what you're going to offer. Yeah, it's the same, it's the same process. So you have eliminated yeah. gaming from this. Yeah, if people understand The rational, the rational thing is... Okay. Yeah, the, and so the key caveat here that Congress seem pretty comfortable with, but I'm, I'm curious for this audience, is like, this all depends on people understanding this perfectly and abiding by what we've told them and, think, and assuming that we are not deceiving them in any way, um, which we're not. Um, but if they think that they could, they could still think that there's some gaming, even though there's not. So um, that could be one way that. So this is driven by people who wouldn't accept any friends. Yeah. Often, yeah. Right. So that um, consistently fits even on the other track. And you said your original medium was the low probability, meaning you were drawn from the high range. So I mean, are people just learning? <laughs> That you're going to draw a high number. Yeah, so we did. We actually did it slightly different. We didn't just draw from the high range. We told them there's some chance that you'll will draw anything, and that'll be from a uniform distribution. There's some chance that we won't draw anything, and then in that case, it's just not implemented. And then we told them which of the states the world we were in. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Trying to offer right? maybe an alternative explanation yeah. for the. Uh... The extreme resistance of, of some of the folks to, yeah. uh, to sell at any price or yeah. give up on the item and it has to do with the sort of gift nature of this object right and if i'm thinking about you know, like my uh mother-in-law which i don't have but you know um uh gives me a a, a gift uh a week a week ago and yeah. then she comes and asks me um would you sell this for her? Yeah. It would be very polite. Yeah. You know, it's very polite to hold on to it. I'm so appreciative of this gift yeah. that I just don't want to. Maybe they're feeling like a, if it's the same agent who's 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 doing it, first gifting it and then asking you to price. Maybe maybe there's some of the rea reactions are ones where where are they testing my loyalty? Are they yeah. testing my gratefulness? I believe yeah. Yeah. Would that be a factor there. I think it, it, it could be. I mean, that's one of the alternatives we have in mind. I think one of the things that makes it somewhat less plausible is. Um, I think I misspoke on this and then correct myself. And so again, the same thing is going on here where if you're asked to make a prediction, then we're telling you um, that you will eventually be making that decision in a week's time. So here people had the understanding that even from the very beginning that they would be offered the chance to buy it back. Now it still could be a gift, but I guess the analogous situation is your mother-in-law gives you this thing and says, I'm going to ask you if I want this back in a week. And so I don't know, that might, might make it seem like it's not as much of a gift, but it's possible. Yeah. Yeah. This pen I'm using right now, I don't value, but right now I'm using it. So I wouldn't immediately push to part with it. These are really useful items. Yeah. Yeah. Would there be a valuing of the, of the utility of the thing with the object is doing that's a factor? I think, yeah, I think there could be. So, yeah, they're, they're not the kind of thing where like there's some mechanical process that's going on right away. So like, it's not like, for in most cases, they wouldn't have a pot of rice cooking when you step away because this it takes time to get to the study site and that sort of thing. But um, yeah, we were concerned about this when we, when we picked out the items, not only um, something like you're using it right now, but also there could be complementarities to other assets you have or between assets. So we tried to kind of avoid any assets that look like that, but um, yeah, that could be a story. Um, I think also the fact that the effects are basically the same for all of the assets um, would just mean that you would need to basically have that kind of I'm using now thing be the same for each of the assets to see this happen. They can sell it back to you and then go to the store and buy a new one and take it yeah. back home with them, right? Yeah, exactly. If they were yeah, really using things, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, thanks for explaining this. This is like this finding is super 
surprising yeah. and fascinating to me. I'm curious if you know if the willingness to accept does that vary based on income? So is it that people with more resources, higher income, are the ones who say no? I will not accept anything. I want to keep this item, and that people with fewer resources will basically yeah. accept anything. Or did you not find that systematic? I don't. I don't remember. I think we looked at that, but I don't remember what we found. That's a great question. Uh, yeah, that would help shed light on that. Yeah. Yeah, one more question left. Yeah. Okay. I'm actually wondering my very views uh, about the, the story that you're telling with respect to the down effect of your, your experimental conditions. Yeah. So um, if you follow the logic of the bug study, right? So let's say you're down with the bug. Yeah. And now you're given an opportunity to put the mug up for collateral, yeah. so the other collateral, to get a pen. Yeah. Wouldn't you expect a higher purchase because you have to give up the thing that you're endowed, but you're fine, you're not finding that. And that's why I'm fun fundamentally confused about the connection with of your findings to the endowment of that. Yeah, so I think it's not a perfect story. It's about getting a new good, yeah. the same asset store. So I guess I'm not sure. Like I would have thought that you would be less willing to use the mug as collateral because you're already attached to it. Um, so I guess- so, then that, Wouldn't that translate into you want a larger loan? Because see, I, I, that's what I'm, I'm just not, I'm not getting the, the logic of the single asset, other asset, and connecting that to the finding that you have around the account. Yeah, so I, I guess the idea is that, um, that, Yeah, I, I see what you mean. I, I guess the idea is that like the your how much you're willing to pay for the loan shows how attractive it is to you, and so um, then yeah, if you're if you're putting the thing up as collateral, you're risking losing that, and so then that, you would demand a higher value. I would say I think it's a pawn shop. Yeah, pawn shop law. Yeah, right? if you go to the pawn shop. You have this endowment that you're getting the bunch up to hold on to yeah. when you get a loan. If you value that, you're going to demand a higher loan than something that is the same asset. You're not being paid the loan, though. Like, you have to pay that money back, right? Like, you're getting the money, so then you have to pay it back. So it's the price of the good holder. So, higher loan means it's a higher price, so you value it more. Yeah, I get that. That's right. I think that's the general logic, but I think I see what you're saying, which is that in some cases, like, if you take out a larger loan, maybe you're more likely to default on that loan. That's also part of the calculus here. And so we don't like when we set up a model for this, we take default rates as constant, but um, so maybe that can get us some of that. But yeah, 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 yeah. sounds good. Cool. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, so I, I'm very curious to hear more about what everyone thinks about the potential compounds, potential stories behind this effect. I think we were just as surprised as you all seem to be when we saw just how striking this effect was. I think at first it was like, our hypothesis is, is like it worked. And then as we looked at the magnitudes, it was almost impossibly large. So um, yeah, so so I guess, as I mentioned, default rates, I'll, I'll say what happened here. So when we actually looked at what happened after people took out these loans, um, repossession was super uncommon. So the default rate was less than 1%. These are fairly small loans, fairly short term. Um, late payment rates were about 10% for the other asset collateralized loan and 12% for the same asset collateralized loan. Um, but we don't see any evidence that they're uh, significantly different from each other. Um, so this is sort of suggestive evidence against the partial attachment case um, and more in line with just you mispredicted something. Um, Okay, so I'll just walk through a model that I think is sort of helpful for understanding more about how people are thinking about this and, and how the results relate to existing literature. Um, okay, I'll, in the interest of time, I'll just breeze through this because it's mostly not important. The key uh, takeaways are, so we're modeling the endowment effect as reference dependent preferences with status quo refer reference points. What I mean here is, in the most basic level, we're thinking of the endowment effect as driven by loss aversion, where losses hurt more than gains. 
Um, and that's we're scaling how much loss is hurt more than gains by this lambda term um, that enters in your utility function, which governs how you make decisions. Um, we also introduce a term for your level of sophistication and how much you're mispredicting your endowment effect. And so we're calling this alpha. And so you can think of your actual utility as being kind of just a weighted sum of what you predict and then what actually happens. And the weight is just um, this alpha term. So how much are you underestimating your attachment to things in the future? Um, we're thinking about people's decisions in terms of three periods. So T1, you can, or T0, sorry, you can think of as the first period in the experiment where you're making the predictions, then we give you the item. Uh, T1 is when you're being offered the two different loans and you're making the willingness to accept decision where we offer to buy something back. And then T2 is when you're then, you actually have the loan and you're repaying it, um, assuming some sort of exogenous default probability. Um, which we'll call D. Yeah. So you're assuming a piecewise energy. This is expected value except for lambda. Uh, yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. So some key takeaways: we've worked out this model. We've um, basically um, used it to characterize what we would expect people to see in terms of their behavior. Um, and then we're going to use that to basically take our data and calibrate the model and then try to get out what, is, what are the values of these key parameters, specifically what is the value of uh, the lambda equals loss aversion um, so that we can compare it to existing literature, um, but also this alpha, which is uh, people's level of sophistication. And so the, one of the main takeaways is when you compare willingness to pay for the same asset collateralized loan to the other asset collateralized loan, um, it's mostly a function of just how much you value the asset, um, but then that's scaled by your level of loss aversion. So the more loss averse you are, the greater your difference in preference for the two loans. Um, it's inversely proportional to your level of sophistication. Um, and then it also depends on default rates. So the difference between the loans is most uh, apparent when we think default is more likely. Um, if default rates are zero, then you shouldn't have any preference because you care about categories. Um, okay, so we just developed this model. We then run our data into it using uh, what's called the uh, minimum distance estimator using the uh, method of moments. Um, so what we mean by moments is we just basically, for the most part, have a series of means um, and standard deviations of key things that we see in the data. Um, so key things like what is the mean willingness to accept? What is the mean predicted willingness to accept? What is the mean predicted and actual willingness to pay for the items? And so what we do is we then basically see, okay, we have all of these means. We have this model for how people are supposed to make decisions. What are the parameters that we care about um, that come closest to then matching the model to the data that we observe in the real world? So this gives us these parameters for loss aversion, sophistication, default rates. Um, our, model uh, deviates slightly from the standard uh, gain, uh, gains divided by losses framework, or losses divided by gains framework. So we've translated it here um, to, to this lambda, this kind of standard in, in the theoretical literature. Um, and compared to existing lab research, we find a pretty high, endow uh, not endowment effect, a level of loss aversion. So I think the standard thing people are used to seeing is losses heard about twice as much as gains. Um, here we see it's uh, 4.5 times as much. Um, when we look at people's level of sophistication, they're predicting about half of the level of attachment that um, we actually see them having. And that's somewhat consistent with what we saw previously, which is the prediction is falling uh, pretty squarely right in the middle between actual um, behavior and, uh, and the kind of benchmark with no loss aversion. Okay, so I'll wrap up um, with some discussion and especially here, feel free to jump in with questions since I'll just keep talking until the end, I guess, but we can kind of uh, broaden things out here. Um, so just to, to do some summary, so we see a few key empirical facts. The first main one is that borrowers are willing to pay substantially more um, for an item to be able to use that item as collateral and not have to put something up that they've owned for just a week's time. Um, this is despite the fact that we randomized the item, which gives the same baseline value of each of these items in question. 
And then the second main finding is that they underpredict their future attachment um, measured via willingness to accept, and they overpredict their future take up of the other asset collateralized loans um, while predicting the uh, same asset collateralized loans correctly. So the main interpretation here is that borrowers exhibit substantial endowment effect driven what we think by loss aversion. Um, this makes people less likely to be willing to put uh, collateral at risk if it's something they already own. And borrowers only slightly, or only about half anticipate this. So they don't know how strong their endowment effect will be over new assets and how much the reference point will adjust. So when we think about whether these loans are good or bad for welfare, there is a few kind of things that make, make the consideration tricky. So the first is just, should we value uh, loss aversion in people's welfare function? So this is kind of an esoteric question of whether we think of loss aversion as a bias that is a mistake people are making and not actually part of their true preferences, or whether it's something that people just kind of hedonically experience and whether we should take that at face value and consider that as um, being something that harms them and that we should uh, respond to accordingly when we think about public policy. Max, yeah. do you think that we should value sophistication in welfare? I was just thinking that if your expectations are consistent yeah. or they're not misaligned, if you're, like if your future projections are off or correct. Yeah, that I think there, I mean, this is also a normative thing, I guess, but I think there, there's probably a stronger case for saying, look, if you were to correct people and tell them this is how you'll actually behave, yeah. then they would respond accordingly. But, um, but it's hard to know how to do that, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we showed that people underestimate how their reference points will adjust if, if you buy this endowment effect story. And this could happen, harken back to what I was saying in the motivation through two different mechanisms. So it could just be that they underestimate how attached they'll get to a new item. Um, they could also overestimate how long they'll feel a sense of loss if they lo lose the endowed good. And so it could be that um, you find the same asset collateralized loan so attractive because um, you think that if you lose an item when you default, this will hurt you forever. Um, and we've shown basically that reference points seem to update fairly quickly. I mean, we saw these results over just the course of a week. If you've lost a thing because you defaulted on a loan, you may also then think this will be really painful, but then in a week's time, you're just fine. So in that sense, there could actually just be too little to take up of the loan um, because people are underestimating how quickly they'll adjust to the loss in the case of default. Um, and in this case, the SACL will have more take up compared to the OCL, but it, it could also be too much take up. So it's kind of unclear in which direction these effects will go. Um, there are also just other reasons to think that take up of other asset collateralized loans might be too low in this context because people might not have existing assets that they can put as collateral. Um, so in this case, like introducing a new financial product that is accessible to people just because it doesn't require anything um, could make them better off. Um, I'll mostly skip over this. Um, the, the main point here is that it really depends how quickly people adjust to the loss. Um, so there's this question of whether people anticipate that they'll kind of adjust over time and whether or not they over under, underestimate that and whether the loss of loss aversion hurts forever really depends a lot on which kinds of loans are good or bad. So summing up, what have we learned? Um, it seems like the endowment effect in this context plays a key role for important economic decision making, uh, taking up a loan for a new possibly productive asset. Um, loss aversion over collateral makes securing credit with existing assets less attractive to borrowers, as we saw through the uh, loan take up comparison. And the factors that hinder uh, same asset collateralized loans, so things like barriers to repossession, um, just the ability that you have to actually use an asset as collateral, um, how willing a financial institution is to accept something as collateral, um, could be quite costly in terms of driving down demand. So in developing countries, this it could be that these kinds of loans don't exist just because enforcement is more difficult. Contracts are more difficult to write such that a lending institution can come and actually repossess an item, either because in the case of smaller items, they're harder to find or because of legal institutions. Um, in our case, the lender that we worked with 
uh, mostly used other asset collateralized loans. As I mentioned, there was this study that happened about 10 years ago that changed that. But prior to that, they were just accepting cash deposits as security. Um, and once they introduce same asset collateralized loans, take up um, for these large rainwater harvesting tanks, which are large popular investments, uh, went from two to 45%. So it's just this huge increase in take up of productive assets um, to replace the cash collateralization with the thing that you're purchasing. Okay, uh, I will wrap up here and um, open it up for, I guess we're out of time, but happy to discuss after. There's, as you saw flashing by, there's some ongoing research on this. Um, so happy to discuss any of that or the research I've presented here, but thanks for your time. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I spent some time in Nairobi. Yeah. And one, one amazing thing was that he was dying quite a bit. So, you know, when I went to a uh, city market, for example, before going there, I asked uh, somebody in a hotel to, uh, and tried to learn how to handle it. And somebody told me that if they say 2000, yeah. be sure to say how about 1000. Yeah. And then negotiation goes on, right? Yeah. So, and if you are cheated, quote unquote, uh, in, in American sense, it's your fault because yeah. you're done. Yeah. Right? That, that's a, maybe that's what, what people mean by gain. Yeah. But gain is not gain, that's way of life. Yeah. So right. I wonder to what extent this kind of uh, you know, daily reality might influence your result. Yeah. Yeah, I think it definitely could. I think um, we tried to take steps to mitigate this through good practice rounds with other goods, um, and also through emphasizing the fact that we were partnering with a financial institution that they knew very well and had repeated interactions with and trusted. Um, but I, I think you're right that that's something that is worth taking very seriously. I, I don't know which direction that would go with in any, but. Um, yeah, you could think of it shading preferences one way or the other, um, but have to think more about what, what the prediction yeah. might be. Yeah, so uh, well, bottom line is that your results are consistent with endowment effect. Yeah. But by calling an endowment effect, you put into a uh, lot of things like attachment. Yeah. Or yeah. Now, I wonder if the pattern of the result could be consistent with this kind of uh, aggressively uh, proactive, competitive nature yeah. of business transaction. Yeah. Uh, that appears to be very common in that particular yeah. city. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, I think in some senses it also made the uh, price solicitation a little bit easier because people were familiar with going through this process of uh, considering multiple prices in a row, saying yes or no, that sort of thing. Um, it was a challenge to emphasize that it, like to to make sure people were on board with the fact that the price draw was random and uh, that that meant that they should tell us their true cutoff point. And so, yeah, that's a, a key caveat here. But, uh, I guess for the point, do you have a willing to pay be lower than it actually is, and a willing to accept to be higher than it actually is? I see. Yeah, yeah, that would make sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I think that these are actually the paper showing willingness to pay is um, highly correlated with actual behavior. Oh, okay, great. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Real quick, uh, your decision to have uh, your utility functions except for land, uh, which I guess economists would say you assume super centrality. Um, do you think that could have affected the higher than typical alpha lambda values that you observe? So if you had added curvature, uh, you know, diminishing sensitivity, some kind of concave utility function that you would have gotten lambda sort of closer to the experiments to because they usually have yeah, yeah. curvature. They allow curvature. If you don't, then that yeah. bias your estimates. That's a good question. I'm, I'm going to just speculate here because um, I'm trying to remember what one of our co-authors of theorists in this better position to speak on this. But I think I 
two things. I think we try several ways of modeling utility and one of them accounted for risk aversion, but I don't want to hang my hat on that. Uh, and then the other is that I think we're estimating um, lambda off of a local discontinuity so that even if there's curvature away from that, that, that wouldn't be exactly what we're picking up, but, but I, need to, I need to go back and look at that. Yeah. I think even with substantial risk aversion, it, you would still get something higher than uh, the kind of standard two estimate of lambda, but, um, but that's just a guess. It's always fun to invest in economists uh, assume risk neutrality and give up expected utility theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. <laughs> yeah, we're trying not to do that. <laughs> yeah, maybe we maybe we don't. <laughs> oh, okay. I can also come up afterwards, but my question is about the results as you presented them. It's kind of back to Rich's first question. Like my understanding of the endowment effect, I would have predicted that when we were talking about the amount they would pay towards the loan, that the the, not the same collateral, but the other one, the OTC, that that would have gone down between the initial like willingness to pay and then like the amount the loan is valued. What we saw was that stayed the same, right? And yeah. the other bar went up. Yeah. So this to me doesn't seem like the endowment effect because should the endowment effect have caused a change on the other collateral? I guess like maybe you can help me understand why that bar stayed the same because I was expecting to see change there, but the change happened on the other side. Yeah. Sorry, I know plot is like very far back in the talk. <laughs> I've, been, I've been trying to rationalize this the whole time and I just have not okay. come to a good answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't think it should be too far. Was it this one? No. No, it's no, very no. When they said, oh. well, it's the fact that this, this kind of puzzle of the, uh, that, um, that that's the same to our point. Which yeah. is, is, that, is that the real market value? Uh, no, it's, it's under the market value. Yeah, and a lot of that is coming from people that just don't, like, they wouldn't pay the market value, they wouldn't go out and buy one of these things. It's the same as baseline. Yeah, but, yeah. but it's the same as baseline. Why is it the same as baseline? If, if there's an endowment effect, why doesn't that change? Is, like, my point of view. Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, because it's, it's oh, I, I, yeah, the endowment effect should have caused change there because, like, that was the whole hypothesis, and it, it did change. So you're saying that because the SACL goes up, there's an endowment effect, but shouldn't it be that the OACL goes down is the endowment effect. Yeah, so yeah, so I think the key difference here would be um, that here we're just saying how much would you pay in cash today? And here we're saying how much would you pay using a loan over time? And so in some ways, like, you know, it's uh, perhaps you, uh, maybe I, I made a mistake by making this comparison between this 2,200 and this 1,200, like, there's no reason to expect that you would be willing to pay the same amount for something using a loan versus using cash. If anything, you would think that it would be different. And so I think that's what kind of, I think the, the main takeaway here is that these are different, but I don't know that we should make any sort of direct comparison here just because of the fact that they're financed using uh, two different things. Um, are you saying the liquidity constraint cancels out the, the liquidity constraint price effect like cancels out the yeah, cash effect? I mean, exactly. <laughs> yeah, <it's, laughs> uh, yeah, no. Um, because like, why would you expect that you be like? I can understand why you might be willing yeah. to pay more if you were taking out a loan, but shouldn't they have? I, I just, I guess, like, I just don't understand why the baseline is the same. I mean, if there is yeah. a sit down effect. Yeah, point. yeah, yeah. No, I would say, uh, yeah. I guess our interpretation would be that that's an unusual coincidence, or that these are somewhat noisy, and you know. They happen to be somewhat similar, but you're right that that's uh, worth looking into that they're pretty close. <laughs> so, yeah, but your intuition is right. Um, yeah. Um, I just want to end on a note that microfinance was touted as a panacea for poverty in the early 2000s, and it hasn't been. And I think Kevin's research is really exciting because <laughs> it's helping to show how it could be effective or made more effective so more people can access it. So anyway, thank you to Kevin. <laughs>